Hello everyone, this is Rick, and welcome to Astral Club. This is the stages of demonic possession and exorcism. Before we get into it, just want to mention Patreon. If you'd like to support the work of Astral Club, you can do so on Patreon. You get a downloaded library of episodes that you can put on your podcast app and listen to anywhere. There's no commercials, an email where we can talk back and forth, and of course, advanced videos uh, on Sunday. And if interested, links in the description. Next up, private lessons. Uh, if you're interested in uh, working with me to learn astral projection or to sharpen up your current abilities, be glad to send you some information. And if you look in the description, you will find my email there uh, where you can request some info. Okay, the subject of demonic possession and exorcism is one that I find personally extremely interesting. Uh, and I found it interesting ever since, geez, I don't know how I got in, but I was a kid in 1972. I would have been about, what, 11? And uh, I uh, went to see The Exorcist. <laughs> Back in those days, I think they, they, were, a lot, uh, they were a lot easier to uh to get by all you had to do was have the money and they let you in didn't matter what the rating was uh heck ba back in those days they used to have cigarette machines just sitting there in the mall <laughs> free for anybody to use it was a different time at any rate that certainly got my attention uh that particular movie the exorcist uh I wouldn't really think too much more about it other than a couple of nightmares until I was in high school. And in my senior year, I was an assistant in an actual uh, exorcism. And if uh, you haven't listened to that episode, it's called the Demonic Possession and Astral Projection. And I will leave the link to that video in the description if you want to review it, or if you want to listen to it for the first time. Uh, let's start with uh, a trigger warning now. Uh, you clicked on this podcast. If you didn't notice the title, we're going to be talking about uh, demonic possession and exorcism. If that's not something that you'd like to listen to right now, then I advise you to go listen to one of my other 280 or so videos, or podcasts rather, and just do that instead. But if you'd like to uh, learn more about this, uh, these particular phenomena, uh, apart from your Hollywood treatment, which always adds artistic license to the process. Um, I've read many books over the last three decades. However, the uh, two that I will be using are... An Exorcist Tells His Story by Father Gabriela Amort and Hostage to the Devil by Malachi Martin. Uh, Gabriela Amort was called the Vatican's exorcist and he did thousands of exorcisms. Malachi Martin uh, was a priest. He asked to be relieved of his active duties, whatever the proper Roman Catholic term is, um, after Vatican II, because I, he didn't like what he saw. He didn't like the changes to the church. And that's why he decided to leave uh, the active priesthood. However, he found that uh, out in society, especially after Vatican II, the Roman Catholic Church tended to shy away from the idea or the whole idea of demonic possession and uh, an exorcism, and he encountered time after time a need for these services, so he began to provide them, and it's said that he provided thousands of uh, exorcisms as well. Now, uh, Father Amort died in 2016. Malachi Martin died in 1999 under mysterious circumstances. Uh, his assistant, who would drive him around, who was a layperson, uh, used to be ex was ex CIA, and uh, he reported that when um, um, Father Martin went to uh, uh, exercise a four year old child, 
that some mysterious force threw him down, and that fall led to his uh, eventual death. So uh, that's the story that I've read. Um, so that's all I know about that. Um, okay, let's get into one more warning before I get into it. Um, the diagnosis of possession and the process of exorcism is not for amateurs. Uh, I'm reminded of a J.R.R. Tolkien quote, and it goes, Do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Well, in this case, you could replace uh, or swap the word wizards for demons. This is not something to play with. This is a deadly serious um, phenomena. So l listen and learn, but remember, uh, this isn't something to toy with. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into it. There are four basic stages of possession. And once I talk about that, then we're going to get into the last stage, um, which uh, typically requires uh, exorcism. Now, the first stage of demonic possession starts out slowly, usually. Uh, it's called infestation. And infestation, you might refer to this as a haunted house type of phenomena. It's got uh, footsteps, pro uh, voices, apparitions, furniture or other objects might be moving around without human agency, odors with no discernible source. Uh, rather than directly affecting people, infestations usually affect only property, objects, or even animals. You might think of this as kind of a warming up period. Uh, my guess, and based on what I've learned, is that the entities involved, entity or entities involved, are testing the waters. They're looking for vulnerability. Well, like any good predator, you don't immediately hop on the first animal you see. You study the herd and you look for weakness. You look for that old uh, animal. You look for that young animal, ones that are easy to prey upon. And your infestation stage is marked by that type of search by the entities that are involved. Next up is the stage of oppression. Now, this activity, uh, it steps up. Now there's physical attacks, sleep disturbances, uh, including regular nightmares, frequent and severe illnesses, major depression, uh, anxiety, relationship troubles. Um, now, all of these things can happen in the normal course of life. Um, but if all of them happen in rapid, rapid succession, it could be a sign of a demonic presence. Keep in mind, though, once again, this, this is still a rare phenomenon we're talking about here. Um, you know, if you're having a bad day, or you're having some bad times, it's most likely a very physical explanation and not a spiritual or demonic one. So please keep that in mind. We're talking about rare instances here. Number three is obsession. Obsession, as the name implies, at this stage, the afflicted person has been chosen now, and they have a hard time functioning, uh, being constantly preoccupied with thoughts of the demonic, actively commandeering uh, their lives, and frequently they experience thoughts of suicide. Sleep, or at least good sleep, becomes nearly impossible. Um, Number four, now we're into possession. Contrary to popular belief, possession is not demons entering a person's body and taking over his or her soul. A person's free will is never removed, only severely compromised. 
in possession, a person is so physically and emotionally, mentally, and spiritually broken down because of these other three stages that demonic spirits are able to seize occasional control over the person's actions. Telltale signs of possession that the Roman Catholic Church looks for, for instance, are instances of uh, superhuman strength, speaking in a language the victim doesn't know, uh, inordinate aversion to holy objects, and knowledge of events or facts that the victim could not possibly know. So let's assume then that we have a full-on case of possession. Now you need an expert, and that typically is an exorcist, uh, someone with the proper training to, uh, to handle uh, a, a demonic infestation uh, and full-on possession. Now, there are five stages that are typically seen in an exorcism. The first is the presence. The next is the pretense. Then there's the break point, followed by the voice, and finally, the clash. First up is the presence. From the moment the exorcist enters the room, a peculiar feeling seems to hang in the very air. And this is from Malachi Martin's book, Hostage to the Devil. From the moment in any genuine exorcism, onward through its duration, everyone in the room is aware of some alien presence. I can testify to this fact. Um, when I assisted as a uh, high school senior, and once again, if you want to listen to it, uh, links in the description, uh, as soon as we walked into the room after receiving our very, very plain instructions as to how we were to act, um, Outside, it was a warmer-than-usual day in May. And um, when I entered the house, it was an older house. They didn't have air conditioning, and it was very warm down there. But when we finally went into the room of the child that was afflicted, uh, it was cold in there. Um, but it wasn't the cold that... I had noticed really more than anything else at first. It was the oppressive atmosphere. I felt like something was weighing on my shoulders or it was actually covering my whole body and just weighing me down. It felt like taking a step or two into that room was something I might do on a high gravity planet. It was, it was just, it was everywhere and nowhere. Uh, Going on here, uh, this sign of possession is an unexplainable and unmistakable um, sign of possession. All the signs of possession, however blatant or grotesque, however subtle or debatable, seem both to pale before and to be marshaled in the face of the presence. There is no sure physical trace of the presence, but everyone feels it. You have to experience it to know it. You cannot locate it spatially, as I said. It's everywhere and nowhere. Um, it's not a he or a she. It's definitely an it. Uh, sometimes you think that what is present is singular, sometimes plural. Um, when it speaks as the exorcism goes on, it will sometimes refer to itself as I and sometimes as we or may even use my and our. However, it is invisible and intangible, and the presence claws at the humanness of those gathered in the room. And I can testify to that too. I didn't have quite the words as um, Father Martin uh, was able to summon here, but it did feel like myself, who I was, was being torn in some subtle way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Uh, I just tried to ignore everything and keep my mind on my instructions and on what my assigned duty was, which was to hold down the left um, leg. Now, in the early stages of an exorcism, the evil spirit will make every attempt to hide behind the possessed. 
Uh, they want to appear like it's one and the same person. Uh, this is the pretense. The first task of the priest is to break the pretense, to force the spirit to reveal itself openly as, a, as separate from the possessed, and to name itself, for all possessing spirits are called by a name that generally, oh no, not always, has to do with the way the spirit works on its victim. Uh, that's, uh, that is... That is typical of, of much of the reading that I've done. Um, a lot of the names don't seem to be um, all that inventive. You might have one that calls itself the terror or one that calls itself, you know, um, I don't know, uh, the raker or who knows. It, it, the names are chosen carefully to describe how they attack, and they tend to inspire terror in their very utterance. Now, every, ex every exorcist learns that during the pretense that he is dealing with some force or power that is at times intensely cunning, sometimes supremely intelligent, and at other times capable of crass stupidity, um, which makes one... Uh, further, or, or which makes one wonder further about the problem of singular or plural. Um, it's both highly dangerous and terribly vulnerable. Oddly, while this spirit or power or force knows some of the most secret and intimate details and the lives of everyone in the room, at the same time, it also displays curious gaps in knowledge of things that may be happening at any given moment of the present. Um, there are varying degrees of these demonic entities. Some are plainly stupid, low level. Others are much higher. And it depends what entity ends up um, initiating the position. But they often call for help at some time or other during this process. And so you may end up in a situation where you're started dealing with a fairly simple uh, demonic spirit. Um, and then all of a sudden, a much more intelligent entity arrives to take control, kind of like if you ask to see the manager, <laughs> if you're a Karen at a store somewhere, and the, uh, the employee that is suddenly replaced by a much higher up manager with more authority and hopefully greater intelligence at least, um, now, there may be a situation where um, the individual will stream forth with a lot of uh, filth, unrestrained abuse, accompanied by physical violence, writhing, gnashing of teeth, jumping around, sometimes physical attacks on the exorcist, which is why I was one of the four people there holding down the limbs of this, uh, I would say, 11 or maybe 12-year-old boy. Uh, I recall at this stage, there wasn't all of this, there wasn't any words that were going on for the whole exorcism the the child seemed to be in a bit of a trance, but there was writhing at one point. Uh, and so for, uh, probably a long 30 seconds, I had to hold down that leg and you would think that'd be easy. Uh, you know, a senior, uh, guy in high school, only responsible for holding down the left leg, but it took all my strength. And I could see that my fellow assistants were struggling as well to hold down this very slight and somewhat small uh, 11 or 12-year-old boy. Now, once you get past this, the next hallmark is the break point. And this ushers in one of the more subtle sufferings that the exorcist must undergo. And that's confusion. Complete and dreadful confusion. Rare is the exorcist who doesn't falter here at this moment. It's a, he becomes enmeshed in a particular a peculiar pain of apparent contradiction of all sense. His ears may seem to smell foul words. That's literal, by the way. His eyes seem to hear offensive sounds and obscene screams. His nose seems to taste a high decibel cacophony of noise. Each 
sense seems to be recording what another sense should be recording. And this is sensory confusion. And I know there's a word for this because there is an illness like this, but I can't think of it. Uh, perhaps somebody in the comments section can do that. Each nerve and sinew of the onlookers and participants becomes rigid as they strive for control. Panic and fear of being dissolved into insanity runs in quick jabs through everyone there. And I could see the priest was definitely under strain, and we kind of got the, the runoff from that. Um, I was feeling a little confused myself, uh, and I was trying to concentrate on my instructions that I had been given, and I just kept on repeating them over and over to myself. Um, you know, just concentrate, hold down the leg, concentrate. And I just did that over and over again, and eventually the confusion left me. The break point is reached at the moment when the pretense has finally collapsed altogether. Now you've got the voice of the possessed, and it's no longer used by the spirit. Um, now you have a new stranger voice that may not even issue from the mouth of the victim. Um, now at the break point, for the first time, the spirit uh, actually uh, speaks of itself um, and as a separate being. Uh, for the first time, this possessing spirit now uses I or we, uh, usually interchangeably. Uh, another very frequent sign that the break point has been reached is the appearance of what um, um, the father called the voice. Now, the voice is the next stage. It's an inordinately disturbing and humanly distressing babble. The first few syllables seem to be those of some word pronounced slowly and thickly, somewhat like a tape recording played at a subnormal speed. You are just straining to pick up the word, and a layer of cold fear has already gripped you, and you know this sound is alien. It's profoundly alien. But your concentration is shattered and frustrated by an immediate gamut of echoes of tiny, prickly voices, uh, echoing each syllable, screaming it, whispering it, laughing it, sneering it, groaning it, following it. And they all hit your ear while the alien voice is going on unheardly to the next syllable. Um, I recall a very short period where the boy, I thought he was just slurring his speech because uh, uh, I figured he was in a hypnotic state. But I think it was a, a low-level version of this type of voice. And um, uh, usually it takes an enormous effort of will on the part of the exorcist in a direct confronta confrontation with this alien will of evil to silence the voice. Because in order to get on with the exorcism, you must silence the voice. Because the voice is just there to stop the exorcism, to interfere with its process. So um, you have to break this down. And the way you do that is with the authority of Jesus and his church. Uh, keep in mind that all of the books that I have read are based on the Roman Catholic rite of lesser exorcism. Uh, so uh, I'll be using their language. My guess is other religions have ways of dealing with this problem to one degree or another. However, I can't speak to them because I have not read enough of them to really speak in any kind of authoritative way. Using the power and name of Jesus, because according to the Roman Catholic ritual, you cannot challenge a demonic entity personally. You must do so only by the authority of Jesus and his church. Um, eventually, you break down and stop the voice. It dies out. Um, and that's when you get to the clash. Um, now, the clash is a struggle of single personal wills 
without the felt and intuitive contact between two people because now you're you're dealing with your will through the authority of Jesus and his church and this demonic entity. Um, there is now a two-way communication um, with the entity. The clash is the heart of a special and dreadful communication, the nucleus of this singular battle of wills between exorcist and the evil spirit. Painful as it will be for him, the priest must look for the clash. He must provoke it. If he cannot lock wills with the evil thing and force that thing to lock its will in opposition to his own, then the exorcist is defeated. Now, you might think that the demonic entity would be aware of this, which it is, and that it would avoid this clash at all costs. And it does make every attempt to do that. However, pride is the failing of all demonic entities. And so some of the best ways and the way I saw the priest act was to challenge the power and authority of this demonic entity and to challenge its power over Jesus and his church. And that is a challenge that is virtually impossible for the demonic to just allow to sit there. It's like walking up to a, a drunk guy in a bar who's known for fighting and just smacking him and expecting him not to fight back. He's going to fight back. It's in his nature. And it's the same situation here. Now, with all this pressure on him, the priest may exhibit uh, exhibit severe agony. Now, the exorcist that I saw, um, he looked like he was under strain. Um, but I think this wasn't as challenging an exorcism as, as some were. The entity involved was just not as as powerful or resistant as some others uh, are that I've read about. Um, however, he must challenge this entity and it must accept the challenge. Um, and once he's already forced the evil spirit to come out on its own, and if he has not been able to until now, he must finally force it to give its name. Now, I've said in the past that demonic entities in and of themselves don't go by names. But when they manifest in the material, they will produce a name. Because you ask under Jesus and the authority of his church, you demand a name. And it must come up with a name that it will obey. It's forced to do that. Um, it's, it's basically like putting someone's feet to the fire Eventually, they're going to cough up their name, <laughs> and it's really the same situation here. Um, and in a peculiar way, uh, some exorcists find that uh, the more easier an evil spirit can be forced to reveal itself in the clash and its aftermath, the surer and easier will be the expulsion of this invading entity when the moment comes. Um, because to force... Uh, as complete an identification as possible, is a mark of domination of one will over another. Keep in mind, once again, that will is under the authority of Jesus and his church. It's not the personal will of the exorcist. The exorcist draws his strength from Jesus and the authority given to him um, by the priesthood and, and by his training. Uh, now, the evil spirit, having found this home with a consenting host, because on some level, the host has consented to this uh, infestation. Now, it may have been tricked. It may have been weakened severely by the earlier stages of possession. Uh, such that it feels trapped into accepting this thing. But keep in mind that if we're going through an exorcism, it means that on some level, the free will of the soul is fighting back. 
and it is struggling against this domination of its will, which is which is a positive indication. A perfectly possessed individual, and we've got them. We've got them in the entertainment industry. We've got them uh, in the titans of industry who seem to have made billions effortlessly out of nowhere. And we've got them among our politicians. I'm not going to name names because it's not my job to do that, and I don't have the authority to do that either. But just know that they are out there. How violent the struggle at this point depends on many things. The intelligence of the spirit being dealt with and the degree of possession achieved over the victim are perhaps two that we could, you know, speculate about. Um, However, uh, in spite of emotions and imaginations um, and his body, they all are trapped at once in pain and anguish. And in spite of all this, uh, because this is very wearing on any exorcist, the will of the exorcist must hold in the clash. And what he does is to approach his final function as as authorized, as an authorized human um, to uh, witness for Jesus. Now, um, by no power of his, as I've mentioned before, and on account of no privilege of his own, he can finally... Uh, uh, ask the, uh, well, command the evil spirit to, des- to desist, to be dispossessed, to depart and leave the possessed person. If the exorcism is successful, this is what happens. The possession ends. All present become aware of a change around them. And I remember all of a sudden it, it got warmer in the room. Uh, more reflective of what it should be based on the temperature outside with no air conditioning. But it became freer to breathe, easier to breathe. Um, That heaviness that was in the room was gone. It felt light. I actually felt like a little high. That's how uh, nice it felt to be in this light, uh, lightened uh, room after having existed in there for quite a number of hours at night um, in the in the in the process of this exorcism. Now the sense of the presence is totally absent. Sometimes there are receding voices or noises. Sometimes only dead silence. Um, uh, the major thing that happened during this exorcism was uh, the crucifix. Uh, there was a wooden crucifix. It was the only thing on the wall because I believe part of the instructions is to remove all unnecessary furniture and things on the walls. Um, so when this crucifix fell, it kind of made me start. Um, and I thought it was interesting that it happened at the end, but I've also read in certain places that sometimes the demon on its way out will, will strike one last strike to make a point. Sometimes it's a violent strike. In this case, I think it was knocking the crucifix off the wall. Just one way of saying, I'm leaving now, but here's something to remember me by kind of thing. Um, Now, sometimes the recently possessed may be at the end of their strength. Sometimes they'll wake up as if from a dream, nightmare, or a coma. Like I said, I thought he was like in some sort of hypnotic trance. But when it was over, he kind of woke up and smiled at us. And um, you could see that he was free. And then he just kind of drifted off to sleep. And we were uh, ushered uh, out of the room by the assistant exorcist. Uh, And he thanked us for our assistance. Well, if you found that discussion of the stages of possession and exorcism interesting, please hit the like button, share it with those of like mind, subscribe if you haven't already, make sure that bell is on all, and I'd be very interested in any questions or comments you have about this whole process of possession and exorcism that I just discussed. And as always, this is Rick, and I will see you on the astral plane.